Hey everybody, welcome back to HPC Tech Shorts, the engineering water cooler here in AWS. Um, now, today I'm joined by Naina Thangaraj in Northern California. Hey, Naina. Hi. And Angel Pizarro in Philly. Hey, Angel. Hey, all. And guys, we've got some pretty cool news because for the longest time we've been building batch on ECS, on the, the AWS Elastic Container Service. And then, of course, more recently, we extended it to work on Fargate. Um, but today, or uh, well, this week, here, while we're at KubeCon, we're announcing that Batch is now possible over the Elastic Kubernetes Service, which is our uh, cloud-native implementation of, of Kubernetes on AWS. This is good news, right? Yeah, extremely good news. I think we're pretty excited about the possibilities and the customers. And I think, uh, you know, there's there's a lot to talk about in terms of the integration and uh, the work that was done to get this managed service on top of, of Kubernetes. Now, this is, this is something that customers have been asking about for some time, right? Um, lots and lots of customers go out and build their own Kubernetes fleets because that's that's what they're using for the rest of their enterprise applications. And so... But, the, but they've also, at the same time, been asking for batch capabilities because the Kubernetes scheduler is not really built with, you know, the kind of batch asynchronous processing, retry, restart kind of logic in mind. It doesn't have all of the features that AWS Batch has got. So this is kind of a, a good marriage, right? Yeah, so you're right, uh, exactly. Like a lot of customers we talk to, they, they say that they're standardizing Kubernetes across their company. And a lot of the use cases are geared towards microservices, but when they're running things like ML training or any kind of simulations, they're so different from microservices. And they're more like a batch workload where you want a different set of requirements. Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit more about the differences between how a Kubernetes is good at managing microservices, but when it comes to batch workloads, the requirements are a, few, are a little bit different. When you're thinking about microservices, you can think of like, it being constantly available for responding to a request. But when you think of batch workloads, they have a start and an end point. So this end point may be success or even sometimes failure, but they do end versus in microservices, they're consistently being available. Even in terms of response times, we can see that microservices generally expect a response time in microseconds. But That's because that there's like somebody sitting in a web browser waiting for the result, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, versus for batch workloads, like you can think of an ML training model where you're working on a job where you have input data that's being analyzed, this could take sometimes even hours or days, which is not going to be calculated in microseconds for sure. Yeah, I think when we do a study of the average jobs, the average time scale of a, of a, of a you know, so batch type workload will fall into single digit minutes, right? Uh, which yeah. is cool. Hella longer than a than a microservice, you know. Doing yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> They're not even comparable. Yeah, yeah. An airline passenger has stopped waiting. Well, an airline potential passenger, a ticket buyer, has stopped waiting for the website to respond at the several minutes point, and yeah. we're probably shouting at our phone, wondering why why it hasn't worked. But mm -hmm. but for a batch workload, that's that's a normal state of affairs. These are complicated exactly. jobs, mathematically intensive or something like that. Um, the other difference we see is that microservices are generally supposed to be highly available. So the application components are replicated in different availability zones. But when you think of batch workloads, you'd want to concentrate all your compute resources as well as data sources on the same availability zone. And there's a good reason for that. It's because you'd want um, fast access to the data, as well as uh, you can want to bin pack all your jobs onto the same instance so that you can get a better performance and cost optimization out of it. So yeah. the model of how you'd separate this out would be so different for microservices yeah. versus. Absolutely. Other, other things that, uh, to point out about that replication across availability zones, you, you typically want homogenized instances across those availability zones. And when you're talking about batch workloads, you want a diverse fleet for a couple of reasons. One, because you have a very different mix of jobs as you're going through the, the workflow itself. Sometimes you might need a lot of CPU, sometimes you might need a lot of memory. So you have these <laughs> different uh, compute requirements coming in in terms of the fleet that you deploy versus a, a microservice where you really sort of want guarantees on what the what the capabilities are spread across availability zones. So you can think of the difference in terms of scaling needs. For a microservice application, you do see increases in scaling, but it's almost always like temporary and you can measure it on a linear scale. But 
when you think of batch workloads, we see customers first perform a proof of concept where they're tuning parameters for their analysis and they're running a small set of data through it. And then when they're actually ready, they run all their data sets through the through a batch workload and that's called the production analysis. And that's what sometimes can take days. And because they're running all their input, uh, all their data through it, they might only do it just once. And mm -hmm. even if they do repeat it, it's rather infrequent. Right. Batch workload or a job has a start and an end. Um, so you'd have to track the job over its life cycle. So it's starting from when it's being submitted to when it's being placed on a compute resource. And especially in case of like spot failures or hardware failures, you'd want to make sure that you're retrying the job because these are tiny jobs a part of a much bigger analysis. And you want to make sure that all tiny pieces of these succeed. So the retry logic in it uh, is a key requirement there. These jobs are dependent on each other. A lot of times you're passing the outputs of one of these stages to another input as another stage. And you don't want to have automatic tracking of if, if there is a failure in one of the earlier stages, you don't want provision resources. Right. So all of, these, all of these requirements, all of these features about work, batch workloads are actually a core part of how batch the service works and other HPC schedulers as well, right? Uh, and the Kubernetes ecosystem itself has seen this as a, as a need and a requirement. And there are several open source frameworks out there that try to um, cover the gap between what is a microservice and what is a batch workload. And even the, the core API of Kubernetes it, itself is adding in features for running a job. There's this jobs API feature uh, for the Kubernetes uh, service uh, that is, is still uh, nascent in terms of the ecosystem, so it doesn't it doesn't have some of the features that are that are that we think are requirements for batch workloads yet. When you're operating Volcano or when you're operating Apache Unicorn within your Kubernetes cluster, you as the uh, cluster administrator are still responsible for the scaling, for the optimization of the fleet compared to right. jobs, for making sure that you know your response time and and, and that fleet management. Yeah, it's still all on you. Whereas with Batch, it's a, it's a managed service component. So Batch is handling the scaling, Batch is handling the placement and, and, and everything. And, and customers who are scaling up to pretty big sizes have always appreciated that about Batch because Batch is actually like, it's one of the services that that is a heavy user of, of EC2 spot. Yeah, uh, that's correct. It's, it's got some really good skills that, that are built into that service now that, that are able to exploit large swaths of spot. They're really good at scaling up and scaling down. There's a lot of paper cuts that can be done on the way to scale on the on the way to scaling a fleet um, mm -hmm. that Batch just natively understands and gets right. But this is my opportunity to say that we often say inside the company that there's no compression algorithm for experience, and Absolutely. Batch is the place where we are accruing all of that experience about how to manage large fleets of of, mm -hmm. of instances for getting large workflows, large workloads of, of batch jobs yeah, done. Right. So um, basically, anyway. you know, batch is the entry point for workloads. Uh, other other schedulers like like Volcano or Unicorn will be the entry point within uh, your EKS cluster if you deploy those. So it's a very similar scheme. You're not talking directly to the Kubernetes scheduler. Uh, but assuming you're sending your jobs into batch, uh, you have an EKS managed uh, node group that's running your other EKS applications. What's actually happening underneath the hood is that batch registers that you are going to deploy to that cluster and then manages all the batch nodes, scaling them up. You could have multiple compute environments, you know, like you could have spot, uh, spot auto scale, batch auto scale group, or you could have an on demand auto scale group with different uh, capabilities. Uh, and then batch, once it has the node ready signal from the scheduler, it's been added to the cluster and you're, you're you know, monitoring uh, daemon sets have been deployed. Uh, it starts placing the nodes itself. It's actually working with the kube scheduler with very tight constraints saying, put this pod on this node, right? And the reason for that is because we are doing the scheduling algorithm since we are the ones who are reallocating the resources um, in the very same way that we tell ECS go and place these, these things on these nodes. Uh, because again, you can't really decouple resource allocation and scaling from what's coming, the work that's coming. So we do a lot of sophisticated um, um, uh, you know, sort of management of that fleet based on the workload that you have told us you're about to run. This is a new product, right? We are just releasing this to our customers uh, and we're super excited to see how people pound on it, quite frankly. They <laughs> <laughs> really, really stretch the boundaries on it. I, I'm going to point out that, yeah. that batch customers have, have been responsible, and this is dirty laundry, that... Bring it on, guys. <laughs> yeah, bring it on. Uh, but to Just set call the Nina if you have any you know, problems. Uh. Right. To set, the, uh, set the expectations because there are actually two schedulers, right? There is the batch layer and there is the EKS layer. You are adding some indirection in terms of how pods are placed or jobs are placed. Uh, and it's not going to be as fast as, as you can do today with ECS. But that's our goal. Our goal is to start, you know, really push the boundaries of, of how quickly you can get pod placement within uh, Kubernetes managed nodes. Yeah, Angel, Nina. 
How do people get started with Batch on EKS? We have a workshop uh, that walks you through some simple examples, um, a hello world, and also just a, a small workshop, which we'll also be doing at reInvent, um, that shows you how to leverage uh, Kubernetes uh, clusters within Batch. OK, so if people are at KubeCon this week, they can come and find either of you. They can come and chase you down. Yeah, and <laughs> yep, we have it on Wednesday morning. You can chase down one of the engineers who was responsible for this, Devendra Chandra. He's uh, he, he'll be giving a talk at 11 a.m. at our booth, D1. Uh, so hopefully this, uh, you know, uh, you'll be there. If not, uh, the sessions will be recorded uh, from KubeCon and, 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 and on the AWS YouTube, YouTube channel. So you could see me and Nana go through exhaustive details of what, what, what this feature is. Excellent. And then finally, if you're at reInvent, come and see our, our workshop. And, and uh, there's a Chalk Talk session uh, where uh, we'll have another engineer walking through the specifics. Uh, and you can grill them on, on how to implement this on AWS Batch. Uh, Nana, Angel, thank you for coming today and talking to us about this. This is really cool. Thank you for having us. <laughs> All right. And with that, uh, if anybody out there wants to see us cover some future topics, uh, if there's any other topics you want to see us cover in some future tech shorts, uh, please come and find us on Twitter. Our DMs are open. Uh, or if there's uh, stuff that you want to see us deep dive into further uh, about this particular release today and, and some, of the, some of the features, uh, we'll be sure to get Angel and Nana back. Till next time, thanks, guys. Thank you.